ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय I am going to read Shrimad Bhagavad Gita chapter 9 text 30 take a note Are you sure I'll just read the verse because we have time constraints Api chet sudura charo bhajate mamana ha sadhur eva samantabya samyak vyavasito hi saha even if one commits the most abominable, abominable action. You know what abominable means? It means very bad. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Purport. The word sudura cha used in this verse is very significant and we should understand it properly. When a living entity is conditioned, he has two kinds of activities. One is conditional and the other is constitutional. As for protecting the body or abiding by the rules of society and state, certainly there are different activities even for the devotees in connection with the conditional life and such activities are called conditional. Besides these, the living entity who is fully conscious of his spiritual nature and is engaged in Krishna consciousness or the devotional service of the Lord has activities which are called transcendental. Such activities are performed in his constitutional position and they are technically called devotional service. Now, in the conditioned state, sometimes devotional service and the conditional service in relation to the body will parallel one another. But then again, sometimes these activities become opposed to one another. As far as possible, a devotee is very cautious so that he does not do anything that could disrupt his wholesome condition. He knows that perfection in his activities depends on his progressive realization of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes, sometimes, however, it may be seen that a person in Krishna consciousness commits some act which may be taken as abominable socially or politically, but such a temporary fall down does not disqualify him. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that if a person falls down but is wholeheartedly engaged in the transcendental service of the Supreme Lord, the Lord, being situated within his heart, purifies him and excuses him from that abomination. The material contamination is so strong that even a yogi fully engaged in the service of the Lord sometimes becomes ensnared. But Krishna consciousness is so strong that such an occasional fall down is at once rectified. Therefore, a person who is situated in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, the process of devotional service is always a success. No one should deride a devotee for some accident or fall down from the ideal path. For, as explained in the next verse, such occasional fall downs will be stopped in due course as soon as a devotee is completely situated in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, a person who is situated in Krishna consciousness and is engaged with determination in the process of chanting... Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, should be considered to be in the transcendental position, even but if by chance or accident he is found to have fallen. The words Sadhur Eva, he is saintly, are very emphatic. They are a warning to the non-devotees that because of an accidental fall down, a devotee should not be derided. He should still be considered saintly even if he has accidentally fallen down. And the word mantavyaha is still more emphatic. If one does not follow this rule and derides a devotee for his accidental fall down, then one is disobeying the order of the Supreme Lord. The only qualification of a devotee is to be unflinchingly and exclusively engaged in devotional service. In the Nrishingha Purana, the following statement is given. Bhagavati cha hara vananya cheta brisha malino pipi rajate manushaha nahi shasha kalusha chabihi kadachit timira paravabhavatam upaiti chandraha. 
The meaning is that even if one fully engaged in the devotional service of the Lord is sometimes found engaged in abominable activities, <coughs> these activities should be considered to be like the spots that resemble the mark of a rabbit on the moon. Such spots do not become an impediment to the diffusion of moonlight. Similarly, the accidental fall down of a devotee from the path of saintly character does not make him abominable. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee is in transcendental devotional service can act in all kinds of abominable ways. This verse only refers to an accident, accident due to the strong power of material connections. Devotional service is more or less a declaration of war against the illusory energy. As long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusory energy, there may be accidental fall-downs. But when one is strong enough, he is no longer subjected to such fall-downs as previously explained. No one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee. If one does not improve in his character by devotional service, then it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee. Quite an extraordinary statement by Krishna. Who is a sadhu? A sadhu means uh, the most basic thing, you'll think he'll be well behaved. Isn't it? Even sometimes among our devotees, we we may, all devotees are supposed to be sadhus, but we may say, oh, this one's a sadhu. Means he's exceptionally well behaved, renounced, detached, like that. But Krishna says, even if one is engaged in the, wor the very bad, duracha means bad activities, and suduracha means very bad activities, if one is situated in devotional service, then he's a sadhu. And then they say, well, wait a minute, if you're a devotee, then you don't do bad things. But uh, Prabhupada explains in the purport that uh, it may be that someone is, due to bad habits, they have some fall down, but because their determination is that I must serve Krishna, therefore they're still considered a sadhu, even if due to past bad habits they sometimes do something which is not devotional at all. Krishna here is not saying that it's all right for devotees to be sinful. That, okay, chant Hare Krishna and perform some sinful activities. In Bangladesh there's a saying that uh, Hari Hari Bol or Magur, you know this? Well, all Bengalis have left. They only sing, they don't hear. I guess they don't. Hari Hari Bol or Magur Ma Cher Jhug. You can understand. Magur Ma, you don't have Magur Ma in Arisa. I don't think so. It's supposed to be the most tasty variety of fish in Bengal. And Jhug means like a soup made from that fish. So chant Hare Krishna and then take fish soup. No. That is not being recommended here. Ah, uh, Krishna is not saying the devotees should be sinful, but actually this whole section is glorifying bhakti and bhaktas. That devotional service is so exalted that even if someone is occasionally, accidentally, uh, <coughs> engaged in some wrong activity, they're still to be considered a sadhu, if they're a devotee. Or it may be that someone, they have uh, quite a prominent defect in their character. You may see that someone's they're dedicated to being a devotee, but they're maybe angry by nature, unnecessarily getting angry, or something like that. Rough in their dealings. But if they're dedicated to... So if their intention is to serve Krishna, then one should not point out the faults. Just like the example Prabhupada has quoted here from Nrishinga Purana, if someone looks at the full moon, 
Now we can't see the full moon. Now it's the... Today is... Uh, Amavasya today? Anyways. Yes, it's around the time of Amavasya. Anyway, you can't see in the city. But uh, the moon is dead. Maranchan. Yes. And gradually coming back to life. The waxing moon. In the full moon, we can see the marks on the moon. The, the hair in the moon. Or the rabbit in the moon. Therefore the moon is called Shashanka or Shashi. So if someone points at the full moon and says, look at those marks. Oh, so bad. But the, the moon is lighting up the whole sky. Not as much as the sun, but it's more beautiful than the sun. You can't even look at the sun. The moon is so beautiful that Krishna is often compared to the moon. Krishna Chandra. Govinda Chandra. Gora Chandra. But if one simply points out the, the spots, then one is a fault finder. The, the, the beauty of the moon far uh, outweighs the, the marks. So if a devotee, if someone seriously concerned to serve Krishna, that endeavor to do so, Krishna says, is so great that a few defects, and, and here he says not even a few defects, but even some apparently very serious defects, that is not to be taken seriously. Now, uh, Krishna is of course speaking to Arjuna, and Arjuna was concerned to do the right thing. What is my dharma in this situation? He was in a situation of dharma sankat. What is the right thing to do? Is my duty as a kshatriya to fight? But on the other hand, how can I fight against my gurus and against my relatives? So he didn't know what to do. And he thought that to fight would be very bad. You're getting a trans... No, no translation. It's too difficult to translate. I'm going so fast. He thought that to... I can't remember the verse. Anyway, he says that it's not good to... F Obviously, it's not good to fight and kill your guru. Any of my disciples here want to kill me? No. Some of them. Some of them do. No. Good disciples don't kill their gurus. Ah... <coughs> Yeah, Arjuna, he was uh, concerned to do the right thing. He was concerned, should I fight or not fight? Though he was, he was considering to fight or not to fight. But Krishna told him, you're asking the wrong question. You're, you're on the wrong track altogether. It's not a question of whether you fight or whether you don't fight. That's not, that's not the consideration. Is not even the consideration whether, whether you follow dharma or you don't follow dharma. That's why Arjuna, he, had, he seemed to have such a hard time to understand. Again and again, he, throughout Bhagavad Gita, he keeps on asking, what is, what is, first of all, you ask me to, to uh, renounce, and then, then you ask me to work in devotion, and even at the 18th chapter, he's asking, what is sannyas? He seems to be confused about this. He didn't get the point that, the real point is to satisfy Krishna, not whether to fight or not to fight. If Krishna wants you to fight, you should fight. If Krishna doesn't want you to fight, you shouldn't fight. That's the point. So Krishna wants to establish this point that bhakti transcends ordinary dharma. If one is engaged in bhakti, then even if everything else is very bad from the worldly point of view, still that's glorious. That's, it's much better to do bhakti and go against the world than not to do bhakti and be pleasing to the world. This is uh, revolutionary, again, just like we, we see people are praised for building hospitals and schools, but... You know, this is, this is useless. It's, what's, what's the actual value? People are dying. And 
they, they die without knowledge of Krishna, so what's the use of building hospitals and schools? But as Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasara Thakur said, the neophyte devotee ringing the bell in the temple of Krishna with some vague idea to please Krishna, his doing so is more valuable spiritually and even materially than materialists opening millions of hospitals and schools. Who will understand this? This is the point. That Krishna is making that even if you do everything wrong, even if you do everything right in the world, but you don't do bhakti, then it's useless. And even if you do everything wrong in the world, but you do bhakti, then that's glorious. Of course, bhakti should be properly understood. What that means. It's another misused word in modern India, bhakti. And bhakti for my dog and my my country and my wife and my cricket team and everything except for Sai Baba and all this nonsense, but not for Krishna. Bhakti means for Krishna. There's no meaning to the word bhakti. Guru bhakti, that can also mean that, but that means guru should be a devotee of Krishna. It's all subsumed within Krishna bhakti. This uh, principle is established by Narad Muni speaking to Vyasadeva, who wrote so many books of the Vedas, which uh, Narad came along and said, Well done, you compile all the Vedas, it's all useless. Which Krishna also says in the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, well, pretty much useless. <laughs> Unless you come to this point. So Vyasa was establishing what is dharma, but Nara told him that if one gives up one's dharma to engage in the service of Hari, the lotus, the lotus feet of Hari, and doesn't do very well in bhakti, they didn't lose anything. Sometimes people say, oh, you, you don't do bhakti. You, you better concentrate on your material life. Because you see, if you don't do well in bhakti, then you'll be in a problem. You'll have difficulty. So first get your material life together, and then you think about bhakti. We often hear this said. But Narad Muni says that if you take up bhakti, and your material life is a mess, or you give it up, you give up your material duties, no loss. And if you do all your material duties perfectly, but... You don't do, don't worship Krishna, then it's all loss. Everything is useless. Great success, whether you are Ambani or Bila or whatever you are, all useless without Krishna Bhakti. So, uh, Krishna is bringing Arjuna to the right consideration. What, uh, Arjuna wants to do what is right, but he's got a completely wrong idea of what is right and wrong. And actually everyone in the world is going on on this misconception. And most of the commentators of Bhagavad Gita, they also uh, talk about karma, either perform your duty or renounce the world, either karma or jnana, but they miss the point, they miss the whole point of Bhagavad Gita, which is stressing that it doesn't matter whether you, whether you work in this world or renounce this world, you have to, that's not the point. Neither of them are very important. One has to act in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna. That is the actual point of Bhagavad Gita. And one who tries to serve Krishna is always well situated, always in a better situation, always better situated than those who don't try to serve Krishna. <clears throat> Here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada that when he was speaking on this verse in the 1960s, at that time, Brahma Ananda was prominent devotee, he was temple president at Iskon, New York, which was a room smaller than this. If any of you have been there. You went there? You never went to 26 Second Avenue? It's... it's yeah, quite smaller than this. That was the, that was Iskon. That was it. So Brahmananda was the president, 
Prabhupada said, even if you saw Brahmananda smoking a cigarette, you should still consider him a sadhu. Wait a minute. And that didn't mean that Brahmananda went out and smoked a cigarette. He didn't do that. He didn't misunderstand it. But that same idea is given. Amanittananda jadi shura bari jai tatapi o shemo nittananda rai. Prabhupada quoted this. I, he didn't give the source of it. That my nittananda, even if he goes into a wine den, he's still my worshipable nittananda. In other words, he must have some purpose in doing so. So, even if Brahmananda smokes a cigarette, well, maybe it's... He didn't do that, but the idea is that even if a devotee reverts to some bad habit because their intention is to serve Krishna, they'll come out of that. And he's not to be considered a, a demon. He's made some mistake. It's, we're not saying smoking cigarettes is good. Devotees should smoke cigarettes. Which brand do you want? We're not saying that. But we're saying that even if you happen to see someone who wants to serve Krishna, but they're circumstantially they are victimized some by, by some bad habit. Maybe we should see that they're still a devotee. We don't reject them. Now, if someone in materialistic life, if they do something wrong, that it's it uh, destroys their whole reputation and everything, doesn't it? There are so many instances of politicians... I remember there was a candidate for the Democratic, he was, this was maybe 15 years ago, he was a candidate for the Democratic presidential slot or whatever, president's slot. But then he was found out he, was, he had a mistress, which means a, an unmarried lady friend. So then he was out altogether. He was, his nomination, his possibility of nomination was finished altogether. Whereas a little later, a few years later, this uh, other guy, Clinton, Bill Clinton, he was found out to be actually having a you know, very serious affair, but they didn't care. No one cared. But traditionally, if someone does something wrong, just like if a Brahmin is drinking wine, finished. He's bahishkrita, he's thrown out of Brahmin society. Finished. Can't be a Brahmin. Can't worship the deity anymore. Can't do it. He's just out. Go and join the Chandalas. Finished. Wine drinking is considered so bad, so low class. That's just one example. So if you do something wrong materially, then you're finished. King Rigor is an example. He did so much right, so many pious activities, and one mistake, and he had to suffer terribly. But in Bhakti, it's not like that. If you Bhakti is so powerful that even if one makes some serious mistake, Krishna overlooks that and says, He's a sad, he wants to serve me. That's very rare in this world. Such a person should be uh, considered saintly. Krishna is bhaktavatsala. He's very uh, affectionate to his devotees. Krishna has just stated this in previous verse, or one or two verses previous, that ye bhajanti tumam bhakta maite te shuchapyaham One who worships me, Krishna says, he's very dear to me. And I'm very dear to him. So this is the point of Bhagavad Gita. It's not just a philosophical discussion of karma, jnana and yoga, but Krishna is actually saying, look, the, the devotee is very dear to me. I love my devotees. What's Krishna doing on the battlefield at all? He's driving the chariot of Partha, Partha Sarati, because he loves Arjuna. It's a treatise about love. Krishna talking about philosophy, but again and again he says, Arjuna, I, I love you. You love me. Bhaktosime Sakha Chaiti, you're my devotee, you're my friend. Bahuni may be a titani, janmani, tava charjuna, tani, hang veda sarvani, natvang veda parantaka. I've had many births and you, you have also. I remember you don't, but you are with me all the time, Arjuna, wherever I go, you go also. 
So Arjuna is a very dear friend of Krishna. So we have to understand, and that's another point, but the, the, the point is that Krishna is not, he's not just speaking some philosophy, he's speaking to his very dear friend, Arjuna, and he wants to establish that, hey Arjuna, you know, even if you think it's a very bad thing, you're going to kill your gurus and this and that, but look, you're my devotee. You, practically you can't do anything wrong. If, and if I tell you, all the more so, if I tell you to fight, I'm God, but apart from that, you're my devotee, and I'll, I'll, sarvadhaman parityaja mame kam sharnam raja hang tuang sarva pa pebyo mukshi shami masucha. I'll protect you from all sinful reactions. Don't you worry. Don't you worry about what's sinful and what's not. You just do what I say. You surrender to me completely. I'm gonna look after you. You're my devotee. I can deliver you from all sinful reactions. Don't fear for anything. I'm protecting you. Krishna says. So Krishna is he speaks like that. He repeatedly expresses his uh, deep love for Arjuna and for all his devotees. And he's bringing Arjuna to, to this. He's, he's explaining what's going on uh, philosophically, but again and again bringing Arjuna to the point of understanding that, that uh, don't worry Arjuna, you're my devotee. Just be a devotee, that's all. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to renounce or consider what is, you don't even have to consider what is dharma you're already on the highest platform you're already beyond worldly dharma so uh, again this isn't an excuse to act in an, in an ab- abon- abominable way that's a difficult word to pronounce but uh, at the same time it's uh, we should understand that well we could all fall down at any time. Of course, first, of, before you fall down, first of all, you have to get up. So, there's no question of fall down for something who hasn't gone up. So, one should go. But on, on this path, Shurasya dhara nishata duratyaya durgang patas tat vedanti. It's a very difficult path, the path of spiritual life, say the great sages. It's like, it's very fine like the edge of a razor. So it's a very, it's a difficult path. And so there may be fall. Even even we don't really try for it. It can just happen. Because we're in this material world. And as Prabhupada explains it, there are constitutional activities and conditional activities. If we're in this world, we have to, for instance, uh, brush our teeth and... Uh, various activities for the body, but we may also, that's a very basic activity of this world, but we may get, somehow or other, we may get involved in some dispute. People ask us to take sides in some dispute, and if you don't get involved, they'll say, why? Why, you should get involved. You're you're irresponsible. You should take up this cause. And if you do take it up, then you'll have other people blaming you. Then why are you getting involved? It's like this. So, you may be considered unsaintly. If there may be some controversial issue and then the, the sadhu may be considered non-saintly by one party for taking up the issue. And if he doesn't take up the issue, then he may also be considered not saintly by another party. So, damned if you do, damned if you don't, kind of thing. Just like some years ago, Some devotee was blaming me. Why aren't you training your disciples properly? You see this disciples not behaving properly. But then when I go there, the town president, if I try to say something, the town president says, you, I, you shouldn't interfere. So if I try to instruct, then the town president says, don't interfere. And then if he misbehaves, I'm responsible. So, you know, I, what, I, what can I do? You know, it's like, hopeless situation. So someone's going to blame you. Apart from that, I mean, there may be some uh, actual fall down. It may happen. That's why there, traditionally there are very strict rules in human society for, especially for mixing of the sexes because men and women, if they mix up, then there's... uh, 
Balavan Indriya Gramo Vidvangsana Pikarshati, the, the senses are so powerful that even a learned person who knows what is right and what is wrong, they may get bewildered, they may get disturbed and do something that they shouldn't do. So that may happen. So the material world is very dangerous. I it's happened to me several times that things things have happened which you know, I don't want to talk about them, but you know certain women not behaving properly with me and I could be blamed for that. Although I didn't do anything, but they, you know, I could be blamed because somehow or other they're making some improper approach or something like that. So material life is such that or living in this material world, even if one's trying to be a devotee seriously, there may be some situation arises in which one is uh, one can't avoid being blamed or one may actually fall down from the proper standard of devotional service. So one should be very careful, but still there's always a possibility of uh, fall down, which is uh, serious, but Krishna says that one can recover from that. So, uh, One is properly situated if one's a devotee. What does it mean, suduracha? It means very bad behavior. Now, how bad can you be? Let's think of the worst things you can do, like uh, disemboweling your mother. Well, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad, yeah. Uh, Vishnu Thakavar Thakur, in his purport to... this verse says that even if a devotee is engaged in usurping others' wives and properties, he should still be considered saintly. So we can understand that that's considered something very bad to take someone's wife or their property. Of course, in the modern age, it's considered normal, in the Western countries especially. And it's becoming like that in India also. Gradually all these things are going on. That was considered very bad. But uh, Vishnu Chagvar Thakur, he paraphrases Krishna as saying, Konte apratijani hi name bhakta pranashati. That comes in the next verse. Krishna says to Arjuna that you declare it, that my de- you declare Arjuna that my devotee is never vanquished. So, Vishnu Chavar Thakur says that Krishna tells Arjuna to go to the assembly of non-devotees who are doubting this statement. They do not accept. How can someone be a sadhu if they're engaged in sinful activities? Vishnu Chavar Thakur says that Arjuna, you go to those doubters, those non-devotees, and you make a big noise with drums and cymbals, get their attention, and put your hands in your air, and shout very loudly, who is a devotee of Krishna? He is never sinful. He is always saintly. Well, again, the question comes, how bad can you be and still be a devotee? Is there any limit? Well, Krishna doesn't give a limit here. Maybe I'll get back to that a little later. Now, recently I've been, or I gave a whole lecture on seeing from different perspectives. Everything can be seen from different perspectives. Right? So, here's a different perspective. What happens when devotees fall down? Now, this is not uncommon in our ISKCON movement today that even highly respected devotees, they, to put it euphemistically, or maybe it's not euphemistically, but uh, they have some severe test or difficulty. Now, 
there is also the incident of Chota Haridas, described in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, where for a minor fault he was banished by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. A minor fault is not even clear exactly what the fault is from the original text. He begged rice for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's meal from Madhavi Devi. And Madhavi Devi is described as elderly. She was tapasvini, highly ascetic. And she was an extremely advanced devotee. So what was the... Chota Haridas was a renunciant. Probably not officially a sannyasi, but he was considered a renunciant. So what was the fault? He spoke with a woman, but yeah, a very old woman. Prabhupada suggested that maybe there was some young woman present there who Chota Haridas looked at lustfully. He had some lustful feeling. To it. But anyway, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu banned Chota Haridas. Don't let him come to see me anymore. So the devotee said to Chota Haridas, okay, just, just wait a little time. He was fasting. Chota Haridas fasted for three days. And the devotee said, still Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was angry. He wouldn't see him. And uh, they thought, okay, just wait a little time. Then after a little time, his mood will change. You see, if someone, they become angry, and then after some time, their mood changes. But didn't. And it went on and on. And Haridas could only, he was not allowed anywhere near Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even though he'd been an intimate associate. And after one year had passed, he left, went to Triveni, the uh, junction of Ganga Saraswati, unseen Saraswati, and Yamuna, and drowned himself. And some days after this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who knows everything, as the Antaryami, the super soul, and everyone said, said, okay, now call Haridas. He said, well, actually, he drowned himself. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, as if pleased, said, Swakarma fala bhukpuma. Everyone gets what they deserve. It's a very harsh treatment. And, and it, it's the same Krishna is saying that seems to be very harsh treatment. I should qualify that. Uh, the Krishna says, even if one is very sinful, he's still my devotee. Should be considered a sadhu. On the other hand, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Un, apparently unforgiving to Chota Haridas. And he was pleased when he gave up his body for, for what appears to be a very minor fault, not a, not a major fault. Krishna says, Abhichet Sudurachama, one who is very, very badly behaved, he's still to be considered a sadhu. But Haridas wasn't very badly behaved, only a minor fault, it seems. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so severe in chastising him. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasar Thakur uh, has given some comments on why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did this. What can we learn from this? So, uh, he gave seven comments. I will just read three of them, which are relevant, particularly relevant to this discussion that we're having tonight. Although Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is an incarnation of mercy, he nevertheless gave up the company of one of his personal associates, Junior Haridas, for if he had not done so, pseudo-devotees would have taken advantage of Junior Haridas's fault by using it as an excuse to live as devotees and at the same time have illicit sexual connections. Such activities would have demoralized the cult of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and as a result, devotees would surely have gone to a hellish life in the name of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So that's actually uh, something like that's already going on. There are the sahajya or false devotees in Bengal, some of them who say that, well, Nityananda, he married, so he enjoyed his wives, and Chandidas and others, they, they were enjoying 
their wives are having uh, mundane sexual relations. So they're already saying that. Now, uh, all right, I'll read, I'll, I'll, I'll read this, then I'll get back. By chastising Junior Haridas, the Lord set the standard for the for Acharyas or the heads of institutions propagating the Chaitanya cult and for all actual devotees. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to maintain the highest standard. So generally we hear the devotee is more mercy than Krishna. But here, Bhaktisthan Sarasarataka was saying is that an Acharya should be very strict. And not tolerate deviation. Number three, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed that a pure devotee should be simple and free from sinful activities, for thus one can be his bona fide servant. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught his followers how to observe the renounced order strictly. Now this is relevant to our ISKCON society, because as I say, well, uh, it's mostly made up of devotees coming from a Sudurachari background, especially those coming from the Western countries. But even in India nowadays, meat-eating, drinking wine, use of contraceptives, illicit sex, all these things are common, which are all very sinful, actually. Contraception is, according to Shastra, that's considered bruhatya. It means it's the same as an abortion. So, uh, of course, in India, there's still some piety also, whereas in the Western countries, very sinful. And devotees in the Western world, who are mostly the leaders of this movement, come from a very sinful background, and the standard expected of an acharya is very high. Acharyang mang vijani yan, navamanyeta karhi chit, namartya buddhya suyeta sarvadeva maya guru. Lord Krishna states, in connection with the uh, outlook of a brahmachari, and especially, but this may be not only for brahmacharis, that uh, one should consider the guru, the acharya, as Krishna, manifestation of Krishna, not disrespect him in any way, one should not consider him an ordinary mortal person. He is the representative of all the demigods and saintly persons. So the standard for an Acharya is very high. Our devotees come from very low backgrounds and it's been seen quite a few times that devotees are acting on a very high platform. Suddenly there it's discovered that uh, they're engaged in very low activities. So, how does which should we apply? Should we apply? There's still sadhus, according to Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, or should we apply the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's death sentence? Prabhupada. No, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati called it death sentence for Choto Haridas. Well, if we applied the death sentence, we'd probably, uh, apart from the fact that we can't enforce it, uh, but if we encourage that, then probably uh, be scandalous and wouldn't have many devotees left, quite likely. On the other hand, Uh, as it said here, if the, the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, such activities would have demoralized the cult of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we actually see that our society is demoralized in many ways. People don't have the same kind of trust in leaders that they used to. And some people are very skeptical even, distastefully. And they say, well, you know, how, how much time before this one falls down? Or you don't know what he's doing privately. Is there, so, uh, what should we do? If a sannyasi falls down, 
Well, we can disrobe him, that means convert him into a non-sannyasi. Or just say, okay, go on with life. Just be a good boy from now on. But it does, it actually demoralizes the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because then people think, well, and what's the use? What, what's so great about being a sannyasi if you can fall down and still go on as a sannyasi? Then what's the meaning of being a sannyasi? So what to do? Is there a middle ground? Can we find a middle ground here? Some kind of compromise between throwing people out and, or keeping them in? Well, I, it's not really any middle ground. It's either you accept, all right, go on as a sannyasi, or don't go on as a sannyasi. If you're going to be a sannyasi, then you can't be a half sannyasi. So, it's a very difficult situation. The best thing is that everyone behaves very, especially those who are in a position of spiritual responsibility, they behave very properly. But, the force of previous some scars or impressions and urges may be very strong. So, well, sannyasi should live in the association of devotees and be engaged in devotional service and not go to extracurricular activities. They should be very strict, we can say this, but again, you can't enforce it. Again, what's, and again, this question, what is the limit? Is a child abuser, now this is a very sensitive point in our society, it, can a child abuser can be considered a devotee, someone who's beaten children severely, or uh, mistreated them sexually? Now, we're not supposed to talk about these things, but earlier this year I was... Uh, in Tamil Nadu, I was speaking on the issue of homosex. And the devotee didn't want to translate what I was saying. Saying, these people, they don't even, better not to speak to them about this. But then, shortly after that, the Indian government made, the, you know, this whole thing came up. Then everyone knew about it. So we may say we shouldn't talk about it. I said to the devotee, he said, yeah, I don't want to translate this. I said, look. It's going to come up soon in India because they're following everything in the West. And it came just in a few weeks. So all these things are coming up. So sorry, but uh, we have to apply the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita practically. It's not just some kind of genteel armchair discussion. I mean, Arjuna was talking about killing his guru, which is a pretty heavy thing. Can I still... Uh, can I still be considered a... a, a I, I want to be good, but how can I be good if I kill my gurus? How can I ever be considered good? Ever, my whole life, all I want to do is be good, and now, I, I, now I, I want to kill my gurus. And how can I ever... Everyone will always blame me, and, feel, and I will also feel terrible. How can I do that? How can I fight against my gurus and attack with weapons to kill? So... Arjuna was in a very difficult situation. So that, that comes up also. And some, some devotees say, no, you can't. Someone who's been a child abuser, they, well, they should be banned forever. But others say, well, it's very bad. But still we see that some people have done that. Or they're, they're still serious about bhakti. It's, it's, a, it's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of situation. People, on one hand, they have a very, some very bad tendencies. On the other hand, they have very saintly tendencies. And it may, in, we don't know. It may be any one of us. If we're put in a certain situation, we don't know what bad things we'll do. If you're in a situation, if suddenly you're put in a situation with a whole bunch of kids and you've never been trained how to deal with them and they're also completely wild and you don't have you know, absolutely no guidelines in what to do, then it might seem the best way to control them is just whack, thwack them. And it can become a habit. 
and you might take some kind of perverse pleasure in that. We don't know how bad we can be. We, in the Second World War in Germany, the, the, the all ordi- ordinary people, engineers, doctors, farmers, they were, uh, they were all engaged, they all joined in the movement to uh, persecute Jews. They all thought it was a good thing to do. Everyone thought it was good. Nowadays, you find in the West, you speak to ordinary people, nice people. They're all eating cows. Not all of them. Many are vegetarians. You know, the, and many people think it's uh, very good to open abortion clinics. Now, after this garbaras, then the abortion clinics, sometime after they become more busy, right? So, helping people. That's what they say. They're, they're, they think they're helping people. So is there any limit? Not according to this. Not according to Krishna. But it is a very... Uh, it's a dilemma of a situation. Should we ban someone for very serious, bad activities? We should probably restrict them. That seems to be the tack taken by our movement, that we should, there should be some restrictions, but they shouldn't be totally banned from devotional service. So, yeah, we should be very strict for the sake of upholding the institution. At the same time, we, want, we don't want to comp- totally discourage a person so that they, uh, their precious attraction towards bhakti is completely spoiled. So, like I say, it's a very delicate situation which needs very delicate handling in each case. One who is a devotee, even if he performs the most abominable activities, if he's actually serious about being a he's a devotee. The Krishna very clearly states. On the other hand, we have to, within our institution, there's the need of the individual and the need of the institution. They sometimes clash. Within the institution, we have to be strict so that people don't think, well, you can just you can do whatever you like and it's all okay, because that's how the... Dharma glani, that's how everything falls down. You know, the sahajya sampradayas, they can mix up with other people's wives and uh, do, eat fish and they still consider themselves dev- devoted. So it requires uh, highly empowered acharyas to, the people of great faith in, who can lay down the line, what should be done. But this is Sarasvati Thakur wrote this, but practically, sp- he was, Prabhupada said, I'm 80% more lenient than my Guru Maharaj, but actually this Sarasvati, he was also, he was very strict in some ways, I mean, he, was, he had a very strict manner, but in individual dealings, he was also very liberal. So, yes, we should be very strict and we should be very liberal also. How to do that? Well, that we'll have to see. (laughs) We want to see that everyone has the full opportunity to take the devotional service. We shouldn't blame anyone. Even, of course, there there may be some case where they're not really devotees. Someone may take the position, we might suspect someone of taking the position of a devotee only for material advantage. I mean, I know there are people who have joined this movement with the specific aim of stealing. That used to be common in Mayapur, that people would join six months before the Gorpanima festival, so no one would suspect them. Then all the Western devotees come and they'd go on a robbing spree, and then they wouldn't be seen again. That was quite common until devotees got wise about what was going on. Uh, so that, that such a person is not a devotee. Or if someone joins with the thought, well, maybe, of course that's, it's becoming more strict now, but many used to join with the idea that you know, gradually I can get my uh, 
if I serve nicely, they'll serve very nicely, and I can get a ticket to America, and then gradually I can get a green card. And many, so that's they're not they're not engaged in abominable activities, but at the same time, it's not a very good standard. They're also serving Krishna, but it's not a very good standard. But Krishna here is speaking about someone who's very sincere to serve him, and but at the same time. Uh, falls down due to some weakness. And actually in the case of Chota Haridas, even though he was banned by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it wasn't a an eternal ban. Chota Haridas came back in a spiritual body, not a ghost body, and continued singing for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he was accepted. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made an example of Chota Haridas just to show how strict one should actually be. So, I'll finish there. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guru. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.